Hello on BBC Radio 3, it's time for this evening's feature. Variously considered by her Victorian peers a sage, charlatan, philosopher and fraud, Madame Blavatsky has proved to be one of history's most enigmatic and influential women, causing revolutions in the arts, politics and science. In Travels with Blavatsky, Peggy Reynolds goes in search of the hidden truths of the universe in the company of the grandmother of the New Age. A woman with a, a dauntless energy, very daring, um, so convinced that what she could do, she wanted to do for the benefit of the world. For mind is like a mirror. It gathers dust while it reflects. It needs the gentle breezes of soul wisdom to brush away the dust of our illusions. Seek, O oh beginner, to blend thy mind and soul. Everybody needs it's never been more needed than it is today. How is it that a woman who is clearly a con woman, who is clearly a liar, who clearly had a lot of faults, she swore like a trooper, she ate like a pig, and delighted in tweaking the sensibilities of both Americans and Brits, nonetheless could sit day after day and year after year and crank out coherent doctrinal works. The wider the sweep of his spiritual vision, the mightier will be his deity. But where can we find a better demonstration of him than in man himself? Madame Blavatsky discovered modern celebrity she discovered a fundamental rule about celebrity, which is that it must be shameless. Everybody knew that she had to be a fraud, yet she survived it. She was definitely a Leo, a very flamboyant Leo, and Leos in general are impatient, instinctual, strong, dynamic. You sometimes start to feel sorry for them, actually, because it's tough at the top, and the prospect of falling from the top of the tree terrifies them. And the top is where they definitely want to be, even if they only secretly want to be there. And from our modern perspective, there's nothing secretive about Blavatsky's ambition. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky was a woman who wanted to change the world. Or maybe she just wanted the world to notice her. In a funny way, she ended up doing both. In her own time, she was both adored and abused. Today, her name may not be so familiar, but as you'll hear, her influence has been pervasive. Madame Blavatsky lived in the second half of the 19th century. She died in 1891 at the age of 59. She traveled the world, or she said that she did. She lived in Russia, America, London, India, and on the continent. She knew everyone from W.B. Yeats to Gandhi. And she was one of the founding members of the Theosophical Society, which still has active branches all over the world today. Michael Gomes is the curator of the Emily Sellon Memorial Library at the Theosophical Society in New York. Theosophy, literally and grammatically, is from Theos and Sophia, a knowledge, God, sort of knowledge that the gods possess, loosely translated today as divine wisdom. But it is that insight, I would suppose, that comes from a study of all these great ideas that have been the source for great thinkers, from Plato and the Buddha and all of these great teachers, you know, have always probed and questioned eventually the meaning of life, the big question. Blavatsky's first major work didn't appear until 1877. But even before that, HPB, as she came to be known, had established herself as a sage through sheer force of personality. She was a chameleon. Some people said she was fat, others that she was thin. Some said she was earthy and rude, others that she was refined and mysterious. In photographs, she adopted a classic intellectual woman pose, leaning forward with searching gaze, chin in hand. Nicola Bowen is lecturer in English at Birkbeck College London and has written on the appeal of occult spiritualism in the 19th century. There would be a sense of meeting an almost unknowable person and the layers of secrecy that Blavatsky kept 
facts around her history and her life would, I think, heighten that sense for us since we are now so used to informality and openness. But the secrecy and mystique was undoubtedly part of Blavatsky's appeal for her adherence. It's funny, when people describe her, they describe more of this presence. It seems they no longer see the corporality of her, but this presence in her that seemed to really inspire people and really make them believe at a time when, you know, disbelief was a terrible uh, shaking of all of the ideals of Victorian life. Madame Blavatsky's particular kind of spiritual message did not come out of a void. In London, in the United States, and all across Europe from the mid-19th century on, there was a tremendous interest in all kinds of uncanny manifestations. Table tapping, scrying, crystal balls, seances, all were part of the social scene. It was in this climate that Blavatsky's work was received, and according to Pat Devaney, who's a scholar of sex magic and the occult and a practicing commercial lawyer in New York, it was her thinking that promoted a move away from the older forms of medieval occult beliefs. They are indirect and basically had nothing to do with the development of an individual's own psychic abilities. Modern occultism is entirely different, and it's entirely different because it's practical. Everybody is out there doing various strange <laughs> oriental techniques or magical techniques or they're reading the manuscript rituals of the Golden Dawn, and all they're telling you to do is you do A, B, C, D, E, and you will have an experience. That change from this bookish, indirect uh, occultism to modern occultism is due to Blavatsky. And that is what Blavatsky and her founding associates felt that the Theosophical Society was originally for, and why it very quickly became popular among those searching for hidden truths. They were attracted by the hopes they would get a practical occult training and maybe if they were really lucky get introduced to a practical occultist, a Mahatma in the original sense, who would teach them how to obtain personally the development they needed. And it was here in New York that Helena Blavatsky and her friend, the American lawyer Henry Steele Olcott, first had the idea for the society. At the time, they were living in downtown Manhattan. Later on, they moved uptown to West 47th Street, which was nicknamed the Lamasery after the Buddhist monasteries of Tibet. Michael Gomes took me to Gramercy Park, where Madame Blavatsky lived, and where the Theosophical Society began. A lecture was being given by a Mr. Felt on God's law of proportion and the phallic element in religion, Ooh. recent wonders among mediums, history, the soul of flowers, Italian characters, the strangeness of travel, chemistry, poetry, nature's trinity, Romanism, gravitation, the carbonari, jugglery, crooks' new discoveries of the force of light, and the literature of magic. So absolutely everything. Everything, all and everything, everything Very under the sun. Very Blavatsky evening, yes, really, yes, all yes, together, yes. all these different and subjects. And because of that, discussed. Colonel Olcott wrote a little note and passed it to Madame Blavatsky on the other side of the room saying, wouldn't it be a good idea to start a society to investigate this sort of thing? From that grew the Theosophical Society from September 7th at this meeting right here on Irving Place. There's a place offering yoga and Pilates just a block away from where she was lived, so it's just everywhere. Where are we going now? 47th and 8th Avenue. Could you go up 8th? Is that possible? Oh, it's a very short across the fence. Now we see on the camera as well on the next report. And now we are very close to Times Square. Central Park is not too far from us, so it would have been the upper reaches of Manhattan. I think if you went any further, you would have still had farms. And we are at the sole remaining building where Madame Blavatsky used to live known as the Lamissary. And there's a good description from the New York World in March 1877 says that Madame Lovetsky's parlor is rather large and so full of all manner of furniture and articles as to seem small. A hideous image of Buddha is on the mantel and a huge palm leaf waved in one corner. A ferocious tiger's head gaped in another. Heavy tapestry covered the windows, oriental knickknacks, and of course, in the midst of this was Madame Lovetsky's writing desk with her manuscripts. So, 
we get an idea on the first floor, the rooms facing 8th Avenue were uh, her writing room, and then next to that would have been her bedroom, the one window over here. Colonel Olcott's room would have also been there also. Was it, was it odd that Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott were sharing yes, the I same think, apartment? I think time? it would probably be considered unusual because uh, their previous address on 34th Street, they actually had Colonel Olcott's sister living with them to give it more of a aura of respectability. But I think by this time, I think he had been won over, so they were the first examples of roommates. <laughs> <laughs> so this is late 1876 till December 1878. This is where they left for India, right from this building at 302 West 47th Street. This trip to India was only one of the many remarkable journeys that Blavatsky undertook, except that on this occasion, we know that she really did go to India. Even without the Blarney, Blavatsky's origins were exotic. She was born in the Ukraine in 1831 to an aristocratic family. From the first, Helena was difficult, and as she grew older, her difference became more marked. We asked the psychic astrologer, Henry Llewellyn Davis, to read Blavatsky's birth chart. How might this help us to understand her personality? Madame Blavatsky has what astrologers call a strong Pluto, which means that Pluto is very active in her chart. Pluto in her chart affects her so-called female planets, the Moon and Venus. She probably had a whole lot of really tough and problematic, difficult connections with other women, starting with a relationship with her mother. I think poor old Helena felt rather squashed by her mother who obviously felt threatened by Helena's Leo personality. Helena would be found at times behind the gigantic cupboards that contained our grandmother's zoological collection, surrounded by relics of fauna, flora, and historical antiquities. The deserter would be found after hours of search in deep conversations with seals and stuffed crocodiles. For her, all nature seemed animated with a mysterious life of its own. She heard the voice of every object and form, whether organic or inorganic, and claimed consciousness and being, not only for some mysterious powers visible and audible for herself alone, but even for visible but inanimate things, such as pebbles, mounds, and pieces of decaying phosphorescent timber. As everyone around her became more aware of young Helena Petrovna's special powers, Helena herself came to feel that she had a mission. All at once, there was a moment of clarity, and she saw herself led by mysterious oriental guides. I am as the reflection of an unknown bright light. However this may be, this light has gradually been incorporated into me has filtered into me. It has, as it were, pierced through me. And therefore, I cannot help myself that all these ideas are come into my brain, into the depth of my soul. I am sincere, although perhaps I may be wrong. At 17, Helena married Nikifor Blavatsky, who was, as she tactfully pointed out, old enough to be her grandfather. It wasn't a husband she wanted so much as independence. She managed three months with Nikifor, keeping him well away from her person all the time, then fled back to her family. When they refused to support her, she ran away altogether, persuading a sea captain to carry her to Constantinople in Turkey, and then travelling to Greece, Egypt, and on to Europe. In London, in 1851, she met her master. This may well have been a real person, he might also have been her own invention. She travelled on to Canada, the States, Mexico, the West Indies, Ceylon, India, Tibet, Kashmir and Ladakh. How she paid for these journeys, how she coped, how she got away with it, a young woman venturing alone to the farthest corners of the world, are some of Blavatsky's mysteries. More mysterious still are the stories of her spiritual journeys. Michael Gomes. She specifically claims that in her travel she met these men who were certainly living, breathing human beings, though of course very holy by the sanctity of their lives, a sort of loosely connected fraternity. Some were Buddhists, some were not. And it would be quite probable, saying that she was traveling through what is now Nepal or the northern Himalayas or Kashmir at that time, there are many different schools and sects of 
teachers that, of course, you wouldn't find in the orthodox texts, you know, would not be part of any major, major religious group. So it's quite possible she met some individual who decided to give her some basic idea, and maybe she just enlarged on it, because if anybody could have met the Mahatma, certainly Madame Blavatsky would be the main person. Whether she really got to India and Tibet that first time, Blavatsky knew that this home of mystic religion had to be her destination. In India, Olcott and Blavatsky toured, they talked, they traveled. But they had their own ideas of how to live in India and their own opinions of the conduct of the British Raj. We were living in India, unlike the English who were merely surrounded by India at a proper distance. We were enabled to study her character and custom, her religion, superstitions and rites, to become acquainted with her traditions, in fact, to live among Hindus, an enchanted circle, inaccessible to the English because of both the centuries-old native prejudice and the innate haughtiness of the Anglo-Saxon race. The British authorities and their memsahibs despised Blavatsky as she chain-smoked and ate with her hand, meditated and generally went thoroughly native. But nevertheless, adherents and believers gathered around. By 1879, she'd launched her first magazine, The Theosophist. By 1882, Olcott and Blavatsky had transferred the headquarters of the Theosophical Society to Adyar in Madras, where it still is, and more and more people came to hear this new message. At a time when India was the black hole of Calcutta, a place you sent missionaries, the whole uh, debate was what to teach Indians, to te teach them English. In fact, Macaulay had a great line. He said that one shelf of English literature is worth the entire Indian corpus of literature. Here were two foreigners, two white people, who were traveling through India telling Indians that their great traditions were really worth studying and not to jettison it all for a mill, Hume and all of the 19th century thinkers, the Theosophical Society was the first example of an organization that had branches all over India, regardless of denomination or race or creed, and brought people from remarkable backgrounds all together. So it really spurred a real feeling of national identity, and it's no surprise that A.O. Hume, who was one of their original members, went on to start the Indian National Congress. While Blavatsky was there reminding Indians of their own cultural heritage, at the same time she was bringing India back to the West. Valentine Cunningham, professor of English and fellow of Corpus Christi College, Oxford. And first, Stephen Connor, professor of English at Birkbeck College, London. What she does is makes the mystic East the default position, really, for the West in thinking about what the West has lost, needs. In a certain way, it's part of that definition of the West against the East. A classic example of a kind of reverse missionary situation, isn't it? Um, where the Christian missionaries have gone to India, and now people like Madame Blavatsky are going to India, but bringing back non-Christian truths and allegations. And the empire is striking back. The colonial other, in religious terms, is coming here to roost. But the interesting thing is that Madame Blavatsky is the person who puts sacred texts of the East, as it were, into circulation, not just in popular culture in the West, but also in India. There's a story that Mahatma Gandhi arrived in London and was ashamed at his ignorance of Hindu religious traditions and became aware of how much he needed to learn through his attendance at Madame Blavatsky's soiree. The spiritual and cultural hothouse of London in the late 19th century was fueled by Blavatsky's presence. George Bernard Shaw could record a typical day in his social calendar, consisting of a meeting of the Fabian Society in the morning, a seance in the afternoon, and an evening at the opera. But there were new events going on in science and technology that made Blavatsky's influence and teachings more and not less plausible. Nicola Bowen. Many people think that the interest in the supernatural was a flight from science, that science had explained too much about the world. But I think the reverse is true, and in some ways, scientific and technological developments of the 19th century made the world seem more supernatural. The disembodied voices on the telephone are uncannily similar 
to the idea of voices through the ether, the new forces identified by science, such as electricity, cause people to think that spirits of the dead were not supernatural at all, but simply another form of natural phenomena that science had not yet understood. But it would, because science would understand everything. Now it's true that Madame Blavatsky could, on occasion, manifest silver spoons being drawn through three rooms to rest on the dessert table, or paint pots appearing through walls, or the conjuring up of a lost uncle wearing the cross and collar of St Anne. But this was not her major preoccupation. Stephen Connor. She kept on asserting that theosophy was not spiritualism. That spiritualism was just about spooks. And this, this nonsense, this stuff about bringing your auntie and your uncle back from the dead was just vulgar. And it's vulgarity that this herself astonishingly vulgar woman was what she set her face against even though she wasn't above employing Irish washerwomen to go and pose as elemental spirits, you know, when she wanted to put the wind up somebody. But theosophy was to be something more abstract, more spiritual, more aristocratic, not for the hoi polloi, even though it preached universal brotherhood. But of course, in this world of the expanding lower urban middle class, that was absolutely irresistible, absolute dynamite, that sense of potential inclusion within this world that wasn't laughable, wasn't ludicrous, because it had the authority of religious tradition, it had the authority of the kind of mm, pseudo-intellectualism that Madame Blavatsky brought to it. When I became a spiritualist, it was not through the agency of the ever-lying, cheating mediums, miserable instruments of the undeveloped spirits of the lower sphere, the ancient Hades. My belief springs out of the same source of information that was used by Raymond Lully, Picos de la Mirandola, Cornelius Agrippa, Robert Flood, Henry Moore, all of whom have ever been searching for the system that would disclose to them the deepest depths of the divine nature and show them the real tie which binds all things together. I asked if I should pray, but the Brahmin said, pray for nothing. Say every night in bed, I have been a king, I have been a slave, nor is there anything fool, rascal, knave that I have not been. And yet upon my breast a myriad heads have lain, that he might set at rest a boy's turbulent days. Mohini Chatterjee spoke these, or words like these, I add in commentary. Oh, in Yeats's 1926 poem, Mohini Chatterjee, the poet was recalling his own meetings with the man who was one of Madame Blavatsky's favorite assistants and her chosen emissary to Ireland. When Blavatsky herself visited London, Yeats was eager to meet her to get the latest truths from the other side. He's round there all the time, as it were, imbibing this kind of curious mixture. Anybody who rejects his poems realizes this. He will move from the actual banality of a Dublin street or Dublin politics or Dublin art gallery or something, real subjects, and then the next moment he's talking about spirit guides and Michael Roberts and inspiration and gurus and, and, and symbols coming from the ether and writing that crazy book called A Vision, which was all about, you know, a very Blavatsky-like, actually, a kind of story of, of the ages. And, and that is his experience of Madame Blavatsky. He sort of gets that mixture. You know, one minute she's sitting there rolling her fags the next minute she's telling him a story about how her knee was bad in the night and in the middle of the night the Mahatma comes in uh, with a live dog in his hands split open and entrails exposed and he put the dog over my knee she said so the entrails covered it and in the morning I was well and Yates said wait yeah, well, she was full of strange medieval learning, he said, and the cures known to medieval doctors, and maybe that was one of those, and so on. You know, there's this kind of funny mixture, which I think is probably characteristic of her, and that she kind of gave him, well, you know, you could be walking down an ordinary street on a muddy day, and the next moment, you know, you're, you're being talked to or talked through by some ancient Indian. In 1877, 
Helena Blavatsky published her first major work, Isis Unveiled. We have associated with fakirs, the holy men of India, and have seen them when in intercourse with the Petris. We have watched the proceedings and modus operandi of the howling and dancing dervishes, held friendly communications with the marabou of European and Asiatic Turkey, and the serpent charmers of Damascus and Benares have but few secrets that we have not had the fortune to study. There's just such extraordinary strangeness and ambition and kind of madness in the book. This is the book that appears in 1877, and just months before its appearance, Alexander Graham Bell produced and demonstrated the telephone. But she takes care to get the telephone in, and it's absolutely like that. She's looking around at whatever she can see and flinging it into her knapsack. But there's something about that crazy eclecticism. If you're not interested in the religious meaning or truth of any of this, which I am really not, then as a sort of a, putting it grandly, a cultural phenomenology, a way of living, a way of looking and thinking and feeling, Isis Unveiled, in a curious way, is a sort of a key text to the rather addled sensibility of a generation. In particular, Blavatsky's eclectic method was something that later appeared in the works of many of the major writers of the early 20th century. And Blavatsky herself appears in Joyce's Ulysses. What do you think really of that hermetic crowd, the opal harsh poets, A.E. the master mystic? That Blavatsky woman started it. She was a nice old bag of tricks. In 1923, writing a review of Ulysses, T.S. Eliot noticed the connection. Valentine Cunningham. He talks about the way in which Joyce is bringing together modern Dublin with a kind of mythic or literary past, Homeric past, and that's the way forward, he says. It's in such amalgamations that you make, as he put it, the modern world possible for art, not the narrative method, but the mythical method, which is to draw together. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that T.S. Eliot himself jeers at that kind of syncretism which he had been one of those people, in a way, celebrating. Well, first of all, there's Madame Sosostris in The Wasteland, um, who is a medium, actually echoes Madame Blavatsky. Madame de Tornquist, mediumistic-type person in, in the poem Garantian, who is fiddling with the candles as at some seance. We all remember the end of the the wasteland, which is full of, you know, bits of stuff from Elizabethan poets, and then, of course, um, bits of, of Sanskrit. These fragments I have shored against my ruins. Why, then, I'll fit you. Hieronymus mad again. Data. Diadvam. Damyata. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And it wasn't just the modernist writers that experienced Blavatsky's influence. Amalgamation and synesthesia were key ideas explored by the Russian composer Scriabin, who was intrigued by theosophy and followed Blavatsky in devising an elaborate symbolist color scheme. Writer and broadcaster David Huckvale. Scriabin had very strict ideas about it and uh, had a strong key color chart. For instance, C is red and it signifies the human will. G is orange, creative play. And then it gets very exotic as you get into more remote keys. E major is representing dreams, and is sky blue. G flat, very remote creativity, bright blue or violet. B-flat actually had lust, <laughs> not surprisingly rose-colored. Now, he wrote at the top of the score for a, an instrument called the keyboard of light, the clavier de luce, which didn't exist at the time. And he didn't just want colors projected onto a screen. He wanted to absolutely smother the audience, overwhelm them with color. In that respect, I think he was very much a precursor of psychic healing.
Griarban was interested in a group of legendary characters who all shared a connection with Theosophy, Prometheus, Satan, and Lucifer. Scriabin's Prometheus is about the development of the soul towards perfection and eventual dematerialization, an idea that derives in part from Blavatsky's concept of the stages of development towards the higher consciousness. David Huckvale. It starts off with a musical depiction of chaos. And out of that, the individual ego appears. Then we get the idea of the microcosm and the macrocosm the human being and the universe. And this is reflected in the music by using a piano, who represents the microcosm, and the orchestra represents the macrocosm. The music gets more and more sexually excited, and through creative ecstasy, we leave our bodies and we become fully developed soul, integrating the divine and the human within us, and we become at one with the universe. The piece ends on an F-sharp major chord. And if I consult the key color scheme, creativity. So you end in bright blue, the ultimate creativity. As Blavatsky's influence also spread out to artists working in the early 20th century, I rang Sir Christopher Frayling, director of the Royal College of Art, to ask him about the painters most involved with theosophy. There were two major artists at the dawn of modernism who said they were directly influenced by theosophy. There was the Russian artist Vasily Kandinsky on the one hand, and on the other, uh, Pete Mondrian, the Dutch artist. And they were influenced in rather different ways. Kandinsky talked about how most artists have got it wrong. They're too literal. They describe the material world, the natural world, the surface appearance of things. And that the role of the painter was to tap into the inner emotion and the inner soul of the artist. The idea of the artist as a sort of visionary seer who encourages people to look inside themselves. Pete Mondrian uses it in a very different way. He actually joined the Theosophical Society in 1909 and in his early writings on what he was pleased to call neoplasticism, and no one's quite sure what that means, but in his early writings on neoplasticism, he describes theosophy as a way of getting beyond the surface appearance of things into the structures that underlie them. So whereas Kandinsky is all about emotional needs, Mondrian is all about the hidden structures that lie behind reality and the geometry of the world, and what's the significance of the vertical and the horizontal and of colors. So Kandinsky's hot, Mondrian is cool, but both of them use the language of theosophy to justify their progression towards abstraction and abstracting from the surface appearance of things into the reality behind things. That was the basic idea. Another artist who was a committed theosophist is the Russian painter Nicholas Rorich. His wife Helena translated Madame Blavatsky's secret doctrine into Russian, and together they founded their own mystic sect. Agni Yoga. Daniel Enton, who's curator of the Rorick Museum in New York. Rorick painted the founders of all the world religions. Here's Mohammed receiving the Koran from the Archangel Gabriel. In the next room we have uh, Moses receiving the Ten Commandments and Krishna sitting under an apple tree and Jesus is somewhere else and, and somehow he put Blavatsky in that context of people who wrought great changes in the world through their own teachings and life. Rurik's painting as the messenger hooks into the traditional iconography of devotional objects, the sort of image you see left at holy wells in the west of Ireland or in cemeteries in the south of Italy. You've got the saints with halos around the door, you've got the messenger arriving at the door, you've got the great blinding light in the distance and the woman opening the door. It breaks all the rules that people like Kandinsky and Mondrian reckoned were the lessons of theosophy, which was get beyond the material world, get beyond the commonplace, and move into something a little bit deeper. This imagery is very, very commonplace and almost verging on kitsch. Today it would be treated almost like a piece of pop art. He does not appeal to the traditional art world establishment yet people with spiritual yearnings 
see the paintings and just respond. I've seen people wander in off the street and burst into tears. Would you mind describing that one? This big one? Yeah. No, let's mount M, devoted to M, the master who gave theosophy and the teaching that the Rurik's produced, Agni Yoga. It looks totally inhospitable, doesn't it? But the two redeeming things are the little stream mm -hmm. winding through the valley and the light, the bright white light of the sun yes. on the mountains in the far distance. So it moves from dark mountains to pale, and bright And also the, the stream leads you. It leads you to the white mountain, and that's the whole point. But Blavatsky's own path wasn't always an easy one. In 1884, while HPV was in Europe, two of her erstwhile followers in Adyar announced that they were in possession of incriminating letters from Blavatsky, which revealed that she had connived in fraudulent manifestations of her spirit guides, or Mahatmas. Even before this, the newly formed Society for Psychical Research had become interested in her claims. And now, Richard Hodgson, a young teacher and graduate of Cambridge, undertook to investigate. Hodgson published his report in 1885 and largely upheld the accusations against her. Michael Germs. The end result of Mr. Hodgson's report for this Society for Psychical Research is that she had done all of this, her writing of her large books, it was a cover for being a Russian spy, that she was really spying for the Tsar. She demanded to take all of these critics to court. Colonel Olcott refused to allow her to do this, threatening that he would resign from the society. A lot of the Indian members were horrified at the idea that the names of the Mahatmas would be dragged into court or ridiculed. She resigned her position, went to first Naples, and then settled in Würzburg, Germany, of all places, in a very small town. And simply settled down to write The Secret Doctrine, and eventually she was invited to come to London in 1887, and when she arrived, she turned over a pile of manuscript three feet high, and she said, this will show them what a Russian spy can do. The Secret Doctrine was the book where she wanted to lift theosophy out of the yogi bogi hocus-pocus stuff that, that really she affected, at least, to despise the phenomena, the trickery, the levitating cat and all that, all that really marvellously ludicrous stuff was not the point, she said. The secret doctrine is the accumulated wisdom of the ages. It is the uninterrupted record covering thousands of generations of seers, higher and exalted beings who watched over the childhood of humanity. HPB uh, Blavatsky advises study for 10 minutes and then meditate on it for 10 hours because if you really want to grasp a little bit of how the universe evolves how consciousness evolves or at least in yourself you need a kind of attunement to another level of consciousness and i'm very convinced that reading the stanzas and ponder over it that helps you broadening your own consciousness. It does something to the brain. Theosophist Ali Ritzima of the Dutch branch, whom I met at the Dublin Conference of the European School of Theosophy. Also speaking at that conference was quantum physicist Amit Goswami, formerly professor at the University of Oregon. As far as he's concerned, conventional science has too long relied on the dualistic notion that consciousness and matter are separate entities. How then, he says, can two such different things interact? So what is his answer to this conundrum? And where does Blavatsky's work fit into this? The only answer in my own intuition that came out is that uh, you have to switch the materialistic ontology of regular science with a very new metaphysics, namely consciousness is the ground of being and matter is the secondary phenomenon. Instead of saying that consciousness is made of the brain, you say brain is made of consciousness. You reverse it. Then everything fits and everything matches. Everything becomes quite scientific. At the same time, we get a new view of consciousness. Consciousness is the ground of all being. Now, that was the first doctrine of theosophy, to my surprise. <laughs> Someone said if you can understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. Baroness Susan Greenfield, who is Professor of Pharmacology at the University of Oxford. Consciousness really depends on higher order organization, for example, a heart couldn't be conscious on its own, or a fingernail couldn't be conscious on its own. There is something about brains that C 
seem to be associated uniquely with consciousness. Now, what that is, what that emergent property is, we don't know. The problem I have with theories of consciousness that are grounded in quantum theory is how you connect them with the macro world of the brain. I still ask the question, what is special about the brain? Because the same kind of properties in cells that the quantum experts turn to, they exist in cells in the heart and elsewhere. So what is the additional constraining factor that the brain has that a heart doesn't have that would make the one capable of generating consciousness and the other not? I still don't know what, at the quantum level, separates a brain from a heart. Why, if I had a brain, I could... I could while away the hours Conferring with the flowers Consulting with the rain Frank Baum, the creator of The Wizard of Oz, which is probably one of the greatest scriptures in America, and he, of course, was a theosophist, and people have tried to read in theosophical ideas in the color symbolism, the yellow brick road, seeing everything through images and green. Uh, and of course, there's three characters, you know, the tin man wants a heart, you know, the lion needs courage. Uh, the ideas of karma are just simply everywhere in songs today. Uh, you know, the ideas that she espoused are sort of part of contemporary culture. But now, of course, the most interesting thing is, well, what's next? But it's that question that Madame Blavatsky, more than a hundred years ago, was prepared to tackle. After the effort of writing The Secret Doctrine, HPB was tired and often unwell. She settled in London at Lansdowne Road, where she wrote The Voice of the Silence. By 1890, when she moved to Avenue Road in St. John's Wood, Madame Blavatsky was increasingly reclusive. A small group of friends cared for her, pushed her around in a specially designed extra-large perambulator, and tried to help as she worked on her Theosophical Glossary. In April 1891, flew and realized she was dying. Through a friend, she conveyed one last message to the Theosophical Society. Keep the link unbroken. Do not let my last incarnation be a failure. News of her passing was front page news on a number of papers in England, America, and I'll give you some of these uh, quotes. Here's one from the London Illustrated News of May 16th. She had been everywhere, in India, in Egypt, in faraway Tibet, in the States, in every European capital. She kept a gambling hall in Tiflis. That's she was not true, though. No, that's not true. There's a wonderful one here from the, from the Times with an article headed, Madame Blavatsky's Queer Life. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's the New York Times. In India, the Look Now Advocate says, from May 15, 1891, the death of Madame Blavatsky will be a great blow to the Theosophical Society while it will be mourned by all true Indians, sincere well-wishes of their country. Theosophy survived Madame Blavatsky's death. Her methods and her ideas have survived too, and she has had many followers, including, for instance, Mae West and Elvis and Gypsy Rose Lee. But what is Helena Blavatsky's importance today? What was it about her work that made her such a radical thinker? She, without realizing it, moved into a world in which what you thought or argued or publicly said wouldn't matter nearly as much as the much more shifting patterns of rumor, anecdote, and suspicion that constitute the sort of mediated popular culture that we have today. It's a popular culture not of gossiping in the tavern or in the, or in the square, but of mediated gossip between people who will never meet each other in a kind of you know electronic equivalent to the the astral plane that um, madame blavatsky expended so much effort in characterizing stephen connor reckons that blavatsky would have approved of the internet emails and text messages but then i'm pretty sure that she'd also have been desperate to appear in hello she certainly would be glad to know that her writings are still in print and are studied by members of the theosophical society but I wonder, too, if she might not mind too much that her works are often sold in the kind of bookshops that also offer crystals, tarot readings, and books on the power of angels and positive thinking. For if those things, along with Madame Blavatsky's works, help us to reflect on our spiritual lives and responsibilities, then why should we argue? Although I myself think, you know, um, crystal shops are very weird places, as it were. <laughs> She's a kind of guru of New Age mysticism, or somewhere, where all those things have come round again, you know. We all come together because 
if you are interested in the progress of humanity, you will find your way and, and try to do your bit to help the rest. Her Jupiter was in the rather rebellious and forward-looking sign of Aquarius. It is often said that Aquarians are about 50 years ahead of their time. Goodness knows how many years ahead of her time she is. I felt a bit out of my depth the first time I came, but fascinated. You know, I hadn't even at that stage heard about Blavatsky, and it was just um, inspirational. I discovered this as it really was the answer to everything for me I've just made the decision that this is for the rest of my life the most important thing of all behold the truth before you a clean life an open mind a pure heart an eager intellect an unveiled spiritual perception a brotherliness for all. A constant eye to the ideal of human progression and perfection which the science depicts. These are the golden stairs up to the steps which the learner may climb to the temple of divine wisdom. Travels with Blavatsky was presented by Peggy Reynolds and the producer was Melvin Rickaby.